right, so I'm going to be walking you through the Unit 1 Sticky Note Lecture. Um, I have mine in the same book as yours, all right? And these What You Need to Know sheets are going to come in helpful as well because a lot of the questions that are going to be asked in here, I'm going to address through the sticky notes as well. So first we're going to look at ecosystems. So what you're going to be doing here is you're going to be adding sticky notes to your book that match mine while also listening to address the main points. So an ecosystem is just a particular location on Earth with biotic and abiotic components. So a biotic factor is something that is alive, like you, uh, dogs, leopards, sharks, plants, things like that. Abiotic factors are those that are not alive, things like water, rocks, um, when you leave one ecosystem and move into another, you know because of the biotic and abiotic components. They're going to be different in one ecosystem versus another. These ecosystem boundaries, however, are um, sometimes different when they're imposed by humans because we have different criteria. So some criteria that would define ecosystem boundaries might be species of interest, topographic features, or administrative criteria. And so again, we've talked already about the, the abiotic factors um, and the biotic factors. So abiotic is non-living, biotic is living. Next we're going to flip over to page 150. And here we're going to address some levels of complexity. So the levels of complexity that make up a biosphere range from individual to population to community to ecosystem to biosphere. And that's why I have a little star here because this is a really good descriptor of the levels of complexity in an ecosystem. Scientists study different things at each level. So at the individual level, they're looking at natural selection. And I've also put those here. At the population level, they're looking at factors that cause the numbers to either increase or decrease. At the community level, they're looking at species interactions. At the ecosystem level, they're looking at flows of energy and matter. And in the biosphere, they're looking at how um, air, heat, and water move. So the difference between a population and a community is that a population focuses on a single species. A community is all the populations of different species in an area. Okay, so now we're going to flip back to page 134. This section um, talks a bit about why animals live where they do. So, species have a range of tolerance. And this means that they have limits, um, limits to abiotic conditions that they can actually tolerate. So there's two different things. There are fundamental niches and realized niches. So a realized niche is where um, an organism, a species actually lives. The fundamental is where they grow and reproduce the best. So let's look at this curve. In the center, you see this is the, the fundamental niche. This is where they do best. They survive, that's important. They grow also important, but the most important in keeping the species alive is reproducing. So right here in this little fundamental niche, this one is based off of temperature, just an example. This is where they do the best. They can make new babies for the species and keep the species going. 
outside of this though is um, it's also a range of tolerance but they're not doing so well so if they're on the outskirts if it's too cold or if it's too hot then they're surviving but they're only surviving here they can survive they're growing but here's where they really want to be there are generalist and specialist in populations so generalists will um, eat different things live in different places specialists are very specific they want to eat one thing in one place um, generalists are going to do really well with changing conditions because they can adapt more easily specialists do really well if the conditions are stable but if something changes then they become very vulnerable and this can lead to extinction in some cases next we're going to move to page 161 and I understand we're moving around a lot and I am sorry about that but we're following the college boards guide and this book is not directly aligned to that guide so that's why we're flipping back and forth so page 161 there are various ways that organisms or species will interact with each other a few different types of ways are competition, parasitism, mutualism, commensalism. Um, and we're going to look at some of those here. So the distribution of species is going to be based off of their fundamental niche, their ability to disperse, and then their interactions with others. And that's what we just talked about is this competition, parasitism, and we're going to go through each of these. So competition is struggling over a resource. It is one person competing with another. So just like um, think of think of sports. When we go to play football, we are competing for the win. Okay. Animals are competing to survive. There is this competitive exclusion principle, and this says that two species competing for the same limiting resource cannot exist. One is going to win, and the other will not survive unless it moves or changes to uh, using a different resource. Limiting resources are uh, resources that a population can't live without and they occur in quantities or in amounts that a population requires to increase. So a lot of times these animals will go through this resource partitioning. Okay, They are going to divide a resource based on their behavior or their morphology and natural selection is going to favor individuals that overlap less and that's what you're going to see right here in this figure. Um, resource partitioning means so two individuals are competing. Species one, species two, they're all competing over seeds that um, are the same size, medium sized, okay? Natural selection is going to favor these individuals and these that are not competing. And after several generations, they're going to spread apart, they're going to adapt and start eating different size seeds. So these right here are competing. So let's say they're squirrels. These squirrels are competing over a medium seed. These are not and these squirrels are not. So because competition is hard on species sometimes they're going to adapt, evolve a way to eat either the larger or the smaller seeds. Um, some examples of competitive relationships could be like um, if there are wolves and coyotes in the same area, and I'm looking at that just because of this, um, if they are in the same area, maybe they're both trying to eat rabbits, but there's not enough rabbits for both of them. So they're competing. One is going to end up suffering because the other is going to be a better competitor. So what they would then do is change their prey. So maybe the wolf eats the rabbits and the coyote is going to eat field mice. To help out with this, 
there are three types of resource partitioning. There is spatial, here you see them, spatial, temporal, morphological. Spatial means that animals are going to work in different spaces. So for example, with the wolf and the, um, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong one. Spatial would be different spaces. So this black grandma grass, grass is going to grow shallower roots and this tar brush is going to grow longer roots. So they're in different areas. This one is down here, this one is up here. Morphological is evolution of body size and shape. So for example, um, these two species are going to change so that they can eat different things, just like Darwin's finches. And we'll talk about those a bit later. The last type, or the last type is temporal. So another example, the wolf and the coyote, the wolf might hunt in the morning and the coyote at night so that they're not going after the same prey at the same time. Next we have predation. Predation is um, the use of one species as a resource by another. And there's four types of predators. You can see those here. Um, four types of predators. There are true predators. True predators kill and eat what they have. So for example, a lion. Herbivores means that uh, the plants are prey. So like gazelle eat plants, they eat grasses. Parasitite parasites live on or in the host that they consume. So for example, a tapeworm, it lives inside you or a dog or something. Hopefully you don't have one um, or your dogs. But they take nutrients from you. They are benefiting, you're being harmed. And then last is a parasitoid. These lay eggs in other organisms. These are things like flies. Um, Predators are important because they control prey. To defend themselves, prey have evolved defenses, um, and those are listed here as well, and you can see them in this image. These are different ways to either camouflage themselves or um, an outer defense, so morphological um, they might have a chemical defense, so they might be poisonous. These are all things that are going to try to dissuade predators. However, predators are important. So for example, um, let's, use, let's use South Carolina. We have coyote and we have deer. Coyote are very good at controlling deer populations. Now, if there were no coyotes, deer would take over, they would eat everything, which would then cause them to starve, and then they would be dying from either starvation or diseases. When there is a good population of coyote, then the coyote are eating the deer. The deer aren't eating all of the grasses or whatever other plants. Um, they, they're working it together almost. The uh, next type is mutualism. This is where both species are going to benefit by increasing their chances of survival and reproduction. So for example, plants and pollinators. These are so important. Also algae and coral, okay? When I say plants and pollinators, I mean those pretty flowers. Sometimes they look like weeds and they're going to help with butterflies and bumblebees and all of those other good pollinators that are going to take pollen from that flower. They're going to carry it to another and they're going to keep spreading all of this pollen around so that the plants can continue to reproduce and grow. Um, let's talk a little bit about um, these. So important examples are the plants and the pollinators and they are also um, algae living on coral and keeping it alive. So what's happening is, this is another example, lichens and trees. So lichens will grow on rocks and trees. They are made of algae 
and fungi. The algae provides carbs for the fungus by photosynthesis. The fungus is providing nutrients and then photosynthesis is still happening for the fungus. So it's this big relationship where the lichen is benefiting, the tree is benefiting because it's having photosynthesis done, the fungus is getting fed, it's providing nutrients to the tree. Everybody benefits. Next we have commensalism. Commensalism happens when one species benefits and the other is not really helped or harmed. Um, so for example, birds using a a tree as like a perch. Um, bird has a nice resting place. The tree is not really being helped, but it's not being hurt either. Uh, and here's a nice little graph for us, or a table, excuse me, a table. And it shows you, so like the, the negative will be a negative effect. So competition has a negative effect on both species because they're fighting over something and they have less resources. Predation, one benefits, the other is hurt. Mutualism, they're both working together. Commensalism, one is benefited, the other is neither helped nor harmed. Um, so, some cool species in ecosystems that are super, super helpful are called keystone species. So, keystone species are, um, are like, um, they can be predators, they can be mutualistic species, they can provide essential services such as ecosystem engineers. These are things that play a huge role in a community. They exist in very low numbers. Again, this is some of the things that they might be. Um, ecosystem engineers, because I just mentioned that too, um, they are creating or maintaining habitat for others. So like a beaver. A beaver builds a dam. The dam is going to create a water collection. And then you have the opportunity. This is a whole new ecosystem. So new things can move into this and be living and thriving and growing and reproducing. Um, now, in this whole competition dynamic, there is this thing called predator-mediated competition. Predator-mediated competition is when a predator helps reduce the abundance of a superior competitor, giving others a chance. And sometimes these can be keystone species. Um, and here's a very good example in this figure 6.21. Um, so, in New England, these people did a study. They introduced sea stars as a keystone species in an intertidal community. When these sea stars are present, they consume mussels, which are super strong competitors. When they are competing and out-competing these mussels, it opens a space for other inferior competitors that can also colonize. So when there are no sea stars, these muscles dominate the surface. But when the sea stars are present, then they don't dominate and there's a chance for other species to come in and be successful as well. Okay? Ecosystem engineer, just coming back to this because I want to give you a couple examples. These can be things like the beaver. Um, alligators are fantastic at digging out gator holes and swamps and things like that. And then other species, other organisms can come and rest in those holes. And if you have ever been walking through a swamp and stepped in a gator hole, you know the feeling of your heart dropping. Like, hopefully nobody is home. Um, also, woodpeckers. Woodpeckers are real cool because they will create a hole, an empty space in a tree that will also give a place for something else to live. We are next going to come back to page 99. Okay, variations in climate. So I'm going to actually go for a page. Um, 
Climates are characterized by plant growth, which is determined by precipitation, temperature, and soil. Um, first, we're going to talk about terrestrial or land biomes, and then we'll talk about aquatic or water biomes. So, some of the ways that we use these different biomes um, we use cold biomes for forest and lumber we use um, warm biomes with less rain to grow grains and for grazing crops and then warm biomes with lots of rain for just growing crops so the characteristics that determine its productivity, again here, are precipitation, soil temperature. Each of these, because of the precipitation, soil, and temperature, and the plant's life, is going to have distinct mammals. So here there's a bunch of really good figures. This is a very good figure showing biomes um, with temperature and precipitation or rainfall. This is a good figure. This is showing you biomes across the world. Um, this is showing how plant growth can be limited by temperature and precipitation. And this is also going to show human use. So the lowest line on here is going to be the one that's causing limits. So for example, This is temperature here. The blue is precipitation. So on this graph, temperature is going to be the limiting factor. Now, you are going to do a biome book. And this is going to be completed either at home or in school, wherever we are at this point. It's going to go through and talk about each of these biomes. Okay. You need to know where they are located. You're going to know common fauna and flora, temperature and precipitation for each of these different types. Um, I also added a side note here. Um, there's the difference between a temporal rainforest and a seasonal rainforest is the amount of rain. Okay, so we're going to move on to aquatic, aquatic biomes. Aquatic biomes are characterized by salinity, depth, and water flow. Um, they're categorized differently than terrestrial biomes because they, I mean, they're totally different factors. There's no precipitation and there's no soil really to account for. Um, the water depth and the flow influence organisms that live in a um, aquatic biome. So with rapid flow, there's going to be very few producers the organic matter from the terrestrial biomes is going to make up the base of the food chain. Um, in a fast flow, there's going to be higher oxygen, so that means that fish that require higher oxygen, like salmon and trout, will be able to survive. And then in a slow flow, there's going to be lower oxygen. Um, things like catfish can really thrive there. So streams and rivers. Streams and rivers are uh, flowing fresh water. And it might come from either an underground spring or runoff from rain and snow. Lakes and ponds are going to be standing water. Um, some of it is too deep to support emergent vegetation. Now, when I say emergent vegetation, I mean vegetation that is rooted in, rooted in the dirt, the soil underwater, and emerges above the water. So, like um, cattails. There are four major lake zones. There is um, 
the littoral zone, which is shallow soil and water. There will be algae and emergent vegetation, and most of the photosynthesis is going to happen here. Um, then there is the limnetic zone. It's the upper part, open water. Um, this is as deep as sunlight penetrates. So if this line right here is as far as the sunlight goes, then that is the bottom of the limnetic zone. Next is the profundal zone. It's under the limnetic. There are no producers here, but bacteria are going to decompose detritus and they're going to consume oxygen. So there's not going to be any large organisms down there. And then you have finally the benthic zone, which is the muddy bottom. Now in this profundal, we talked about um, phytoplankton a bit or in the limnetic, there's one to be phytoplankton. Um, these are just floating algae. Now, freshwater wetlands, super cool places. They are submerged or saturated for part of the year. It's shallow enough for emergent vegetation. Um, The big difference between swamps and marshes is that swamps have trees, marshes do not. And there are some, some swamps in the Beach Island area that still have these big, incredible cypress trees. Next are salt marshes. Oh, let me go back. So. Swamps and marshes are very uh, good providers. They provide some ecosystem services. So they take in lots of rainwater and they're going to release it very slowly. They're very good at filtering pollutants. And it's a fantastic breeding ground. Um, and also it's a great place for migration of birds. Um, back to salt marshes. These are found along the coast with a temperate climate. They have non-woody emergent vegetation and they're really productive. Mangrove swamps, also super cool. I have not seen one in person, but it is on my to-do list. These are going to be on tropical, subtropical coast. These are trees in the water. They are salt tolerant, like mangroves. They help protect the coastline and they're really nutrient rich. So an estuary is where fresh and salt water mix. This is really productive because um, rivers will dump a lot of rich materials, which means that there's going to be a lot of really good plant life. Intertidal zones are the coastline between high and low tides. These range from stable to harsh with the tide. Uh, there's a wide variety of organisms adapted to live there. Now what I mean between it varies with the tide. So if something is adapted to live when the tide is up, then it's happy when the tide is up. If it's not adapted to live when the tide is down, then it's not happy then. But however, vice versa, little critters that live when the tide is down, they love it. Next is coral reefs. Um, Coral reefs are tiny animals that secrete a layer of limestone, which creates their exoskeleton. There is an animal inside, it's like a little tube with tentacles, that pulls in plankton and detritus, and it lives in really nutrient-poor water. Coral bleaching is a huge deal right now. So algae that live in the coral is dying from disease and from environmental change. So like low pH and high temperatures. Um, rainforests and coral reefs are really really productive and they're so cool because they're so diverse. These are also both found along the equator and they're getting a lot of solar, uh, solar energy, a lot of warm temperatures, which makes it easy for producers to work. So the producers like algae, which are also dying from the bleaching.
In the open ocean, we have water away from the shore. It's much deeper water. Um, different zones in the ocean are the photic zone. This is where there's enough sunlight for photosynthesis. And then the aphotic zone. So there's no sunlight. This allows for chemosynthesis and bioluminescence. Chemosynthesis is uh, creatures using um, chemicals for energy. And then bioluminescence is when organisms can create their own light. Most of that red light is only absorbed, so red rays from the sun is only absorbed in the upper meter of water. And blue light only penetrates below like 100 meters. So this is what really is affecting that photosynthesis. It's why it's not allowed to happen in this aphotic zone. Um, Chemosynthesis is an adaptation so that they can still create their own energy without that sunlight. That is the end of part one. I am going to continue into part two of your wink sheet. We are going to flip back to page 65. And we're going to talk a bit about um, cycles, okay? So the biosphere, we're starting right down here, and we'll come back to this. The biosphere is the region of the planet where life resides. It's a combination of all ecosystems put together, okay? So within this biosphere, there are... Um, pools, flows, sinks, and reservoirs. These are all going to be a part of the biogeochemical cycle. So that is the movement of water within and between ecosystems. It involves biological, geological, and chemical processes. So a pool is a component that contains matter. This can either be air, water, or organisms. Flow is a process that moves materials between the different pools. A sink is a reservoir that takes up a chemical element or a compound from another part of its cycle. And a reservoir is a place, region, or location where biogeochemical elements are in their highest concentrations. So elements can be cycled and held here for some time. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is the hydrologic cycle or the water cycle. Let me come back up here though. Um, the difference between open and closed systems, so some of these. Um, open systems is when energy from the sun can cycle through earth and it's actually emitted into space. Closed systems. Um, matter cycles through energy in a variety of forms it doesn't actually leave so right now we're looking at closed systems so the water cycle fancy word is the hydrologic cycle the chemical formula for water is h2o right now um here is a picture of the water cycle and we're going to go through some different parts of this evaporation is when liquid turns to gas. So it is coming out of water sources, oceans, lakes, and soils. So solar energy is heating the earth. That heat is going to cause liquid to turn to gas. It evaporates. It can come from the ocean, from soil, from plants. It then turns to, um, or transpiration, excuse me. Transpiration, this evapotranspiration, is when uh, plants are releasing water from their leaves into the atmosphere. Precipitation then occurs when water vapor that enters the atmosphere cools. 
and it forms clouds that produce precipitation, so rain, snow, or hail. Evapotranspiration is um, a combination of evaporation and transpiration, so like we just talked about, it's coming from plants. Once the rain, sleet, snow comes down to earth, then it can percolate. This is when water is absorbed by soil and it moves down into groundwater. Um, or it can run off. If it runs off, then the water is moving across land into streams or rivers and then eventually it's going to make its way back into the ocean. One way that humans affect the water cycle is by reducing evapotranspiration. So things like logging, when we clear cut forests, we're taking away all of that plant life that would allow for transpiration or for water to leave out of it and come back up into the atmosphere. When we do that, so same example logging, then you have this huge um, piece of land that's bare now and so that increases runoff. There's nothing to stop the water that's raining back down. And then when we build things like roads, then we reduce percolation as well because we have all of this asphalt that does not allow water to drain down through it. There are some places that do have asphalt that allows for percolation. So there's actually some streets in Aiken that have a like a porous type asphalt that helps to reduce flash flooding because it allows water to drain down through it. Next, we're going to talk about the carbon cycle. So, producers, consumers, and decomposers all play a role in this. They convert and cycle matter. Here's a figure of the carbon cycle. We're going to talk about what happens at each step in this cycle. So the first step is photosynthesis. Organisms are taking up carbon dioxide. Some of that carbon goes into the tissues of plants. Next is respiration. So respiration happens when we breathe. We're taking the food we are converting it into energy that we can use and a byproduct of that is carbon dioxide. So the carbon dioxide is being released back to the atmosphere. Then there is decomposition. Decomposition happens when carbon dioxide is returned to the atmosphere via respiration. So we have decomposers working down here. There is also exchange. So exchange. Carbon dioxide is being released from the ocean in amounts that are almost equal to the carbon that's diffusing into the ocean water. So it should be leaving at about the same rate as it's coming in. However, you know, humans, we've kind of messed that up. Then there is um, sedimentation, burial. Carbon dioxide combines with calcium carbonate to form limestone and dolomite. And these can be buried and turned into fossil fuels. Extraction is when we remove those fossil fuels that have been formed by sedimentation and burial. And then combustion is when we burn those fossil fuels and we release the carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. So the chemical symbol for carbon dioxide is CO2. The um, Ca, CO3 that you will see in your book is calcium carbonate. We care about this calcium carbonate because it forms limestone and dolomite, which is one of the largest carbon pools. So it's one of the largest places where carbon is actually kept. 
Um, photosynthesis creates sugars for plants, and the sugar is glucose. Glucose is um, represented as C6H12O6. We care about that because it takes in carbon dioxide to make it. So it's actually pulling it from the environment and reusing it, recycling it, and oxygen will actually be produced as a byproduct from that. One of the ways that two, I'll go over two, two of the ways that we are really messing up this carbon cycle, one is by burning fossil fuels. By burning fossil fuels, that means that we've extracted fossil fuels and we're using them, burning them at a rate far greater than what they can be produced at this point. Um, also tree harvesting. Trees are plants. Plants make, uh, they do photosynthesis, they make sugar. When they do that, they take up carbon dioxide and they turn it into oxygen that we can breathe. So when we harvest trees, we're taking out a, a big recycler. Next, we're going to talk about carbon cycle. I mean, I'm sorry, the nitrogen cycle. It focuses on, or one of the key elements, one of the macronutrients is the carbon cycle. That's what we're talking about. So macronutrients are nitrogen, sulfur, magnesium, calcium, potassium, and phosphorus. The macronutrients that organisms need in large amounts are these. A limiting nutrient is a nutrient that is required for growth of an organism, but it's available in lower quantities. One of these is nitrogen. Let me scoot this up so you can see it a bit better. Okay. So I need you to know different forms of nitrogen, and we're going to kind of talk about these through here a bit, okay? In the symbol just for nitrogen, it's nitrogen. N2 is nitrogen gas, and I don't have these written out here, but you can see them all through your reading. NH3 is ammonia. NH4 is ammonium. NO2 <coughs> nitrate, nitrite. NO3 is nitrate. N2O is nitrous oxide. So first we're going to describe nitrogen fixation. Nitrogen gas is converted to ammonia which is then converted to ammonium. So what's happening is the nitrogen gas is converted to something that's actually useful. Assimilation happens when nitrate is turned into proteins. So producers take up nitrogen. It's used for like um, plant mass and then eventually it's going to be decomposed. Ammonification is when organic nitrogen is converted to ammonium. So decomposers are going to be eating dead stuff and excreting that ammonium. Nitrification is when ammonium is converted to nitrogen gas by bacteria and this is going to complete the cycle. So we've been through all of the different phases of nitrogen at this point and I've talked about them here. So we've been through nitrogen fixation, we're going from nitrogen gas to ammonium. Uh, assimilation, you're going from nitrate to proteins. Ammonification, you're going from organic to ammonium. Here's a really good picture. Nitrification, denitrification, we've talked about those. Um, leaching happens when substances are transported through soil by water. So, for example, nitrate has a negative, so, uh, negative charge, so it doesn't bond to soil well. It just leaches right through it. Excess nitrogen can get into ecosystems. 
um, by fertilizers is one example. Um, this can alter this can alter species distribution and abundance because there's so much nitrogen being added in that place where the fertilizer has either leached or run off. Next we're going to talk about the phosphorus cycle. Phosphorus is the major component of DNA, RNA, and ATP. Um, and we're going to talk about this being not soluble. So when I say that it's not water soluble, it means that it doesn't mix well with water. And one of the main types of phosphorus that we're going to focus on is phosphate. So a major source of this phosphorus, again, is fertilizer, and it can also come from weathering of rocks. The steps are shown here in this picture. So weathering of rocks is going to release phosphates. Fertilizers run off to streams or plants, animals excrete waste, and then decomposition also releases phosphates. That dissolved phosphate um, will precipitate and it will add to sedimentary rocks. And then geologic forces make that phosphate rock form mountains. One of the questions in your wink in your reading guide asks you what is guano. Um, guano is excrement from seabirds and bats and it fits here because it is high in phosphorus so it's used as a fertilizer. Um, there is not an atmospheric component in this phosphorus cycle. Um, so it does not have a gaseous phase, and the atmospheric inputs are really small. It's mostly just being cycled through earth and water. Um, excess phosphorus, again, gets into these ecosystems by fertilizers. Also, household detergents used to be really bad, so you used to have these things called phthalates. Um, and what happens is these things, not this bad, these things are um, going to cause super rich water from runoff and that really rich water is going to cause um, dense plant growth. This is going to cause a lot of um, a lot of consumption. Animals are going to die because there is really low oxygen. Next, I'm going to go ahead and take us through um, part three. For part three, we're going to go back to page 60. And again, I know, I'm sorry, we're skipping around a whole bunch. Energy, all right? This is how energy is kind of um, being used, moving through the um, ecosystems. So, the ultimate source of energy for everything is the sun. Plants use the sun for energy. And they are the base of production. Right. There are different types of animals. So there are herbivores. Herbivores eat plants. Carnivores eat other animals. And then omnivores eat both plants and animals. Now there are two laws of thermodynamics. And you can find these back on page 39. I'm not going to go there. But I made a little note so that you can go back. Actually, I'll flip there in just a minute. So... Page 39. These laws of thermodynamics, the first says that energy is not created or destroyed. The second says that when energy is transformed, 
the quantity is the same, but it has a less ability to do work. So back up here. Producers and autotrophs are organisms that use the sun to produce usable forms of energy. The equation for photosynthesis, you can see right here, okay? Sun plus water plus carbon dioxide is going to create glucose and oxygen. Respiration is the opposite. So it is literally the opposite. You're taking oxygen and glucose. So we breathe in and we eat food and we convert it to carbon dioxide, a little bit of water, and then energy is provided. Um, this releases the energy that we need to actually fuel our bodies. So different organisms carry out photosynthesis, things like plants, algae, bacteria, um, all organisms carry out respiration. Producers just do it at night when they're not doing photosynthesis. So you are going to draw in your wink sheet, but here is an example of um, a food web. Here's another um, pyramid food web. The difference between these two is that this shows more complex interactions where this just shows different levels of consumers. Um, so like producers will be things like grasses. Then you have primary consumers, um, secondary, tertiary. So primary consumer eats the producer, secondary eats the primary, and tertiary eats the secondary. Now, some really important things in these food webs or in ecosystems are scavengers, detritivores, and decomposers. Scavengers are carnivores that eat dead animals. Detritivores break down dead tissue and waste into smaller parts. Decomposers are things like fungi and bacteria and they're going to complete this breakdown and it completes the recycling of the nutrients. So I mentioned a bit the difference between a food chain and a food web. This is similar to a chain. Um, the web gives you much more complex interactions. Now energy is being transformed all through this web and scientists have come up with this 10% rule. So this means that only about 10% of biomass can actually be converted to energy. And so they found this using a few different figures. They have used the gross primary productivity. This is the total amount of solar energy that producers can capture via photosynthesis in a given time. The net primary productivity is the energy captured by producers minus the energy that they give off or that they respire. So this ecological efficiency is basically the proportion of consumed energy that can be passed from one trophic level to another, and it's really low. It's that 10%. Now, this determines the productivity of an ecosystem because of the amount of sunlight that producers can actually convert into usable energy. Um, The efficiency of transfer between trophic levels, again, 10%. So this figure is showing you that a ton of this energy is being reflected. It's not even being absorbed. 1% is actually captured. 60% is lost to respiration. 40% actually supports the growth. That's using this growth model. Um, that model can also show changes within an ecosystem. So that's one of the reasons that they actually look at these productivity models. Um, if you don't know where you started, then you don't really know where you are at that point, and you don't know if productivity has increased or decreased. So that's why they take those measures. Um, because only 10% of energy is shared, and you can see it right here, there are so many more producers than they are 
primary or even secondary consumers and there's even fewer tertiary com consumers because because they have to eat so much to keep up there's not enough room for high species numbers so for example producers they're getting the full amount of energy that they capture from the sun these primary consumers are only getting about 10 percent of that which means they have to eat more to be full to survive grow reproduce because there's less of these and there's only a 10 percent transfer there has to be less of its predator or less of the secondary consumer that's why there's there's larger numbers of plant life than there are top predators that is it for my unit one sticky notes i am very glad that you followed along and i will see you again for the next set